I'm thrilled to invite our second guest speaker, Jake Barton. Uh, I've been following Jake's work for quite some time and was very excited to meet him last year in New York and visit his amazing studio. And I was very happy to know that he'll be able to join us at the conference today. Uh, Jake Barton is principal and founder of Local Projects, an exhibits and media firm that creates groundbreaking experiences Credits include landmark projects like the 9-11 Memorial Museum, the Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum, and the Cleveland Museum of Art. Local Projects has won every major award, including the National Design Awards and Cannes Lyon, for work that focuses on reinvention of all ranges of forms, including retail, storytelling, and education. Current projects include new museums for the Equal Justice Initiative in Montgomery, Alabama, Planet World in Washington, D.C., and the new Chicago Architecture Center. His TED Talk was nearly a million views, and he is on Fast Company Magazine's list of top 50 designers. Jake will talk about the Engagement First Museum, how do we use emerging technologies to enhance the artifacts, architecture, and design in order to engage visitors. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me here. Very exciting to be able to share our experiences with everyone. Jerusalem in particular, but Israel in general is an amazing place, so I'm very excited to be able to share with you. This is actually a project I can't talk about. It opens in London in two weeks, but it's an early prototype of a new technology that we've developed uh, that builds walls out of light. And I'm gonna talk a lot about prototyping uh, based on the theme of this talk, which is really about engagement. My studio looks to create museums and public spaces that engage. And I think that has been a sort of topic that has been sitting around all of our conversations today. If you think about this artwork by James Terrell, the famous light artist, there's a big question here embedded inside of here that James Terrell and many other artists uh, put to the public when they began their careers. And the question is, where is the art? Right? This is not an object, it's not a painting, it's not a sculpture. This is arguably an experience. It's an environment, yes, but the artwork occurs as you move through it. It's in the space between the artwork and you, and I would argue that's what museums are the best at putting forth to the public. Not necessarily the objects, but the experience of looking at the objects, the experience of thinking about the objects, understanding the objects, learning about them, studying them, sharing them. And once you think about museums as places for that space in between you and the object, you start to think about the active participant and their active role in looking at the artworks, in constructing their experience, in thinking about the artworks themselves. We have translated that into our practice to ask ourselves over and over again, what is it that visitors can do inside museums? That's one of the key questions that we ask when we're designing new experiences. Part of it is that the studio that I started 15 years ago didn't actually begin just designing museums. We designed this project, StoryCorps, which is a partnership with National Public Radio in America that has soundproof booths in public spaces and invites people to ask questions of other people, interview them, and then those interviews go onto the radio. See, the thing of it is, I always feel guilty when I say I love you to you, and I say it so often. I say it to remind you that as dumpy as I am, it's coming from me. It's, it's like hearing a beautiful song from a busted old radio, yeah, well, and it's nice of you to keep the radio around the house. Right? It's like hearing a beautiful song from a broken old radio, and it's nice of you to keep the radio around the house. There's so much emotion there. There's so much human engagement there. And the intimacy of those stories, the humanity of, of those stories, is what makes them so powerful. We've gone on to a range of different projects, certainly that engage different forms of technology. This is at the top of the World Trade Center, for example, where we use gesture control. So a storyteller can answer any questions of over 100 different live data topics to engage people in a range of different languages about New York City. 
We've developed new retail experiences. This is a lab, which is also a store about the Internet of Things in San Francisco for the Target Corporation. They have 3,000 different stores in North America. And they wanted to understand how retail would be changed by the Internet of Things. So you can go into the space and make custom connections and choices in terms of how you would change your home in the future. This is an exhibit that we did for the Tech Museum about synthetic biology, where you're able to clip together different pieces of DNA to create a new form of life and then virtually launch it into a pool of other organisms and see how they compete for resources. So again, instead of just telling you about synthetic biology, we show you, we demonstrate for you by building a tool set where people can actually create and use their own DNA and then in the second part of the experience, we invite people to do it with actual live organisms. These are actual, this is an actual wet lab where you cut together live DNA to create a new organism on the spot that's never existed before. And then you can watch it grow over a number of days online after your museum visit. So again, it's learning by doing. Even in these types of works, this is a media sculpture that we created, which is linear and storytelling based. This is for the National Museum of American Jewish History. We again take a film and we break it onto these curved sheets that look like the letters that European Jewish immigrants read in order to entice them to bring them to America. So even with personal stories about immigration to America, we still want people to be active. This engagement is for a new public initiative around how to rethink schools. So we're surrounding a story booth with a range of new ideas on education, and then you can go in and add your own ideas in the middle. Or lastly, this is uh, one of our more famous works for the Cleveland Museum of Art, where you make a face, and as you're making different faces, it brings forward different artworks that you connect to. This is, of course, the collection to all. You've seen this in a range of different places. And I think the key to all of this, again, is that it's engagement. So as you're producing this performative, renewed idea of what an art gallery can be, it really changes the idea of what a museum itself can be. So that's a very quick overview. And now I wanted to just go into four individual stories about sort of key themes for our work. And obviously, the first one is this idea of participation. Again, what can we make visitors do? How can we invite them to participate within the goal of the museum itself? Now this, I think, is a challenge for museums because museums have always been the experts. Right? That's the whole reason you have a collection. You gather together because you're the expert and then you want to share that expertise with the general public. And I think there's a sense, and you hear it in many of the talks today, as if there was a competition between the curatorial expertise and then the individual visitors. Right? And a lot of times technology is the answer just for distribution. I think in this case, which is the Cooper Hewitt, the Smithsonian National Design Museum for America, we decided to make a shared expertise and invite people to actually learn about design by being designers. These are actually the original pitch documents that we made for the museum. And we had this idea that every visitor would get a pen and they would use that to collect inspiration changing typically passive galleries into an active search for objects that inspired you, and then inviting you to actually make your own objects, which of course would then motivate you to hear from the designers themselves, right? It's a very simple idea that if you look at design, if you look at technology in general, it's democratizing all of these processes. And with this pen, we basically opened up the design process to every single visitor as just a gesture for them to come and create inside of our museum. We had this idea that you would be able to literally do what no other museum would ever ask for, invite visitors to draw all over the walls and create their own wallpaper. And in our original idea, people could then print those and take them with them as their own products. We're still hoping the museum actually follows through on this. This is the prototype that we used to convey, if not to convince the museum that this was not a scary idea, or maybe not as scary as they thought. That visitors could actually both understand the tenets of wallpaper design with all the different repeat patterns, but that they could also find information about canonical famous designers and how they create wallpaper. Again, once you're making wallpaper, you want to know, well, how do other people make wallpaper? And those two things go hand in hand. You look for a curator's expertise because you're engaged yourself. 
It's a dialogue. And in this case, you could also draw forward all of these amazing historic examples of wallpaper and explore the collection yourself. I had an amazing experience where I was doing a tour, a preview tour with the New York Times and with the curator of the entire wallpaper collection. And it was very funny because I was busy talking to the reporter who was asking me questions and the curator was busy on the interface and he was like going through all the different historic examples to the point at which I had to sort of interrupt him. I said, oh, excuse me, Greg, I just want to show uh, our, our friend, the reporter, some of the wallpaper examples. And he looked up at me very sheepishly and he said, oh, yeah, of course, excuse me, it's just I've never seen these full scale before because right, he's been looking at little swatches for his entire career. And so the ability to use technology to amplify what's already inside of the collection as an experience, I think is the great gift that technology can give to every institution. So this is just an overview in terms of how the engagement played out at the Cooper Hewitt. They have more than doubled their attendance. They've met their core goals, which was to not just bring back design aficionados, but to use some of these new approaches to get families, to get children, and to get non-design experts into the building. So you can sketch your own ideas, and you can use the pen to save those different designs that you're creating. As you draw lines, it actually brings forward different objects from the collection. So again, you're an active participant searching by drawing. And then you can also use your pen to discover all sorts of different elements, both on these individual tables and throughout the galleries as well. So again, just the simple act of invitation, come and be a participant, makes everyone active within these experiences. The amazing part is the quantity of people who go back afterwards to review and renew and grab all the materials that they created. A third of visitors go back online afterwards to take the materials that they've either designed, whether it's furniture or architecture, or gather the great best images of the objects inside of the collection. And then inside of the actual wallpaper room, as we call it, the immersion room, you have an incredible explosion of creativity all the time. There is some ways in which we've created the interface so that pretty much anything you design ends up looking good, and that's okay. It's good for visitors to enjoy themselves. But the amazing thing is there were early conversations about how to keep visitors away from the projection screens. There was a lot of anxiety between us and the architects. You know, are people going to be blocking these screens, et cetera? And at the last minute, we were like, you know what, just let's take any of the banisters out. Let's just let it happen in terms of how it's happening. Not even recognizing the degree to which people would be both expressing themselves and then looking to share that expression. Again, once you create something, whether you're... Uh, elderly or whether you're a kid, and I think this is the first ever bacon and eggs wallpaper, certainly that I've ever seen, but once you put yourself into something, it becomes so valuable, and it becomes the greatest representation of the Cooper Hewitt in inspiring design in all of us. And then this ends up happening. People end up generating all of this imagery around their own experiences and sharing that. And that's the message of the museum for the 21st century. And now they have different challenges that they, base, that they base on that. So all of these pictures, I mean, you can go on Instagram and on any day, there's dozens and dozens and dozens of people who are sharing the things that they care about, inventing things that we never thought of. And that's the most important message of the 21st century museum. Second big theme for us is human. What is human and how do we make these objects, how do we make these histories, these artworks, how do we make them tangible, meaningful to us individually? This is work that we created for the Museum of the City of New York, and the key to this approach is that we're looking to integrate between their physical, historic objects and different digital materials that are published on an ongoing basis. So there's three different galleries for di three different eras, and in this case, in the pre-20th century, we mix between different blockbuster uh, artifacts, so these are original maquettes for the Statue of Liberty or the original boat that discovered the Hudson River in New York City, but you can also find individuals and then deep dive into them using these digital interfaces. It's the two things together that make them meaningful. Right? We already know that some people are going to be gravitating towards screens or big projection experiences like seeing this corner called five points then disappear and melt into the present moment. But it's again when you interplay the two together and make them interdependent, whether it's for the 19th or in this case for the 20th century, that suddenly they become much more relevant. 
oftentimes you will see, well, let's keep screens away from objects. Let's make a theater over here and then do a traditional gallery over here. But we firmly believe by, that it's by interlacing them together that you can get a 10-year-old to be pointing at a case and saying, this is so important, or get a scholar to say, well, where is there more information about this? And you get this huge digital scroll in terms of the information that's attached to it. Lastly, a whole third of this museum is given over to the future of New York City. And that's very rare. But in this case, we use a lot of the data and a lot of the visualization and the mapping to point out the future problems of New York. And then instead of just telling visitors about them, we invite them to design the city of the future and then share it. So visitors can design a tower, a park, or a street, and there's different metrics built inside of them that let them know how they're solving issues around sustainability, around income inequality. And once they actually develop those spaces, they can project it full scale, real time, and literally step into the city of the future. In evaluations, this gallery, these interfaces in particular, they're a little complicated for some people. So about a third of people say, well, I don't quite know what to do here, although everyone gets these large scale projections. The people who do interact with these pieces, though, spend over half an hour on average simply just building their city of the future and digging into all the different ways that the city can be made better. And those are the types of metrics that really digital can produce for individual visitors. The second to last project I wanted to share is, is probably our largest work to date and certainly our longest running project is the 9-11 Memorial Museum. And it really stands in for the ways in which emotion are so incredibly important to these engagements. 9-11, uh, whether you're a New Yorker or an American or just someone who was around at that time within the world, holds incredible power. Uh, and part of that is just based on how many people witnessed it live on that day. It was estimated that a third of the world watched 9-11 live around that day, creating a whole generation and a moment of unprecedented global awareness. And I think from us inside of the museum, designing it, we really spent a lot of time thinking about how to embody that notion as an idea. Not to just put a plaque on the wall that said, this many people watched it live, or here's where different people were, but to enter into a space of, again, emotion, and in this case, memory, to evoke that moment in time. One of the biggest challenges for this museum, but frankly for any museum, is this contradiction for the audiences. On the one hand, you have people who run out, ran out of the burning buildings to save their own lives. Literally, 10,000 people escaped those buildings by sheer luck or happenstance and lived, right? And we knew that these were a core audience, that they would show up on the day that we opened, and if we got even one detail incorrect, we would be in very, very large trouble. So there's an enormous amount of energy on getting the story right. On the other hand, we were frank, at least internally, saying that is not really the core audience for the museum, right? Because those people, God love them, are not necessarily the folks who will be coming in 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. We need to build a museum that will work for people who know nothing about 9-11. And you see this all the time in museums. Well, how do we be an art museum and both talk to someone who is an expert on Renoir, but also introduce things for someone who knows nothing? Right? You see it even here. You see lots of amazing artworks that to a, you know, a serious curator, if you look like an Ai Weiwei piece, you understand exactly what he's doing because you understand the context. But maybe for an average person who doesn't know anything about Ai Weiwei or even contemporary art, they might be left you know, pretty much flailing to understand what that actually means. Right? And so that's always a challenge and a struggle between the two. How do you satisfy the expert and speak to them and have credibility for them at the same time engaging new audiences? Oftentimes, at least in America, the answer is the education department. So we take school groups, we take the kids, and they'll go over there and someone will talk to them about the art. But inside the galleries, we're serious. So we have small labels and we try not to give too much context or interpretation. It didn't work that way at the 9-11 Museum. We needed to both fulfill things for people who were experts, the, the folks who lived through the event, and people who knew nothing about it. And our solution was to take the stories from one to engage the other. To think about the museum not as a static place where we would tell you about 9-11, but as essentially a platform, a place for people who live through 9-11 to share their own stories and to hear those stories back in a number of ways inside of the museum and to welcome all of these different points of view. 
And the first thing that you see when you walk into the museum is this. It's a gallery called We Remember, and it's filled with different stories, different memories from around the world. And as you walk through this narrative map, you hear all of these voices recalling what it was like on that day. On the day of September 11th, 2001. On September 11th, September 11th. I was in Honolulu, Hawaii. In Cairo, Egypt. In college at UC Berkeley. I was in Times Square. In in Sao Paulo, Paulo, Brazil. I was in Miami, Florida. In Scottish yeah, Highlands. Right, in we were actually in a meeting when someone barged in and said, Oh my God, a plane has just crashed into the World Trade Center. Center. And I frantically get to a radio. When I heard it over the radio. And so you hear people witnessing it from afar. And then you see people who witnessed it firsthand. And then after that, you go and you witness the entire museum yourself. You yourself are a witness to this history. And there's a range of different ways that happens. This is a memorial experience that shows images. And these memories are updated by family members as they share their own stories. And you understand the messaging again that this was an act of terrorism. So these are ordinary people who were taken away in their ordinary lives. There are moments of extreme compression and overwhelming quantities of material by design. And again, you get a sense of what it was like and the chaos of that moment. We don't overinterpret it to share people's experiences. And then you walk from there into moments of almost complete emptiness where you just listen to people's experiences on that day. It started out a really nice day. When I looked out the window, I see this gigantic plane in the center of Manhattan. You would never really see a plane that big and especially that close. It was making like a beeline for the towers. I could see it coming closer and closer. I could see the AA on its tail. Like I could see inside the tinted windows of the cockpit. And then it just bellowed into Tower One. It was just swallowed up by the building. The plane was gone, and all there was was this red, black smoke. The hell broke loose as far as stuff raining down on top of us. So we had to literally take cover. One of the and so you hear these human stories, and you understand their impact directly, again, through the absence of material except for the human voice. And as you make your way outside, we then bring you back to the present moment. This is a piece that looks at over four million news articles every night and runs an algorithm to connect today's news all the way back to 9-11 itself. So whether you're looking at airline flights, terrorism events, the Middle East, military activity, all of these can be traced through different news articles that are getting connected by an algorithm every single night, bringing it current and up to date and comparative for each visitor every time. Separately, we also invite visitors to express themselves. We create a platform for them to share what they've thought. We use the same narrative map, and as you write your own message, it's projected directly in terms of where you're from. So we don't talk about the fact that the world came together on 9-11 itself, although we share the historic. But in the interface, we recreate a community around 9-11 each day inside of the museum. And when you see pictures like this, you see uh, stories like this, and I literally just shot this on my cell phone, you get a sense of the authenticity of those expressions. My father came home from work that day in a dusty suit. I thank God he came home at all. I miss you both every day. Love you, Dad and Chris. Love, John. Or even we were mere kids when this happened. Now as adults, we understand the tragic impact of this tragic event. So the ways in which you can both bring people in and trust them and have them share is a way in which you can make 9-11 both important and memorable for the future. We did work upstairs for the memorial as well, again, in using technology in an incredibly human and emotional way. The, the memorial has a very unorthodox way that it's arranged. It's not chronological by time and it's not locational, it's actually done by what's called meaningful adjacencies. And those are actually social connections between different individuals. What you're looking at is an algorithm that my studio authored for a full six months during the development of the memorial. We took all of the almost 3,000 names and all of the people that the different individuals knew and map them together. And we're seeing here the different blocks from the two different towers to the four different planes. And then these green lines in between the names represent a brother and a sister, or a best man at a wedding. And all of these relationships are embedded inside of the memorial. And so when you go to the memorial, you can literally look up and see that core structure in terms of the different towers and the different flights. There's eight different groupings. 
You can search and find any individual. So Cantor Fitzgerald is actually a group. It was the largest employer uh, in the top of the North Tower. And so if you click on it, you can see visualized all the different people from Cantor Fitzgerald. It takes up almost half of one of those fountains. But then embedded inside of there, there's literally thousands of stories like this one. So Victor Wald and Harry Ramos didn't know each other until that day. They met on the stairwell going down. Other friends went down and said, come, come, come. And they said, no, 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 we're going down together all the way to the bottom. Both of all of those friends went back and told the family members. And when Victor and Harry, as you can see, didn't make it through, they got located next to each other on the memorial because both of the families asked that they be located together. And that's just one of literally thousands of stories that are embedded inside of the memorial today. And so when we think about all of these different elements, again, we try and focus on engagement. We try and think about the ways in which we can use technology to bring all the visitors into sharing the ethos of the museum, the mission of the museum. We want to put missions into action through the visitors. And in this case, this is the last project I'll show, the Aros Museum, we had a very visionary director come to us with a very uh, crazy visionary request. Uh, and this is some of uh, the work as it made its way out. We essentially were asked uh, by Erland, who's the director, to look into a whole new way to think about digital and to literally reinvent his museum. Now, Aros, if you know it, it's an, an Aarhus in Denmark. It's the second most visited museum in all of Denmark. It's an amazing contemporary art museum. It has incredible installations on the roof of it. It has this piece by Olafur Eliasson. Um, and it's taken a very, very small university town and exploded it with prestige specifically around this museum because it breaks all of the rules. And it's going to keep on breaking all of the rules because it's building this piece called Our Next Horizon by James Terrell. You can see that mound there is actually a huge James Terrell piece that they're going to host performances inside of. And they came to us with a crazy idea. They said, we want to make something called Aros Public. It's a huge spot in the museum, it's an entire floor, and it's not about the specific artifacts of art, it's about all the things that surround it, all the social, public aspects of art. So they host talks, they host senior groups, they have journalists, they have embedded artists, they have open performances, anything that has to do with people and how people integrate through art can actually have their experiences here. And just to put it in context, the number of members in this museum is three times the overall population of the entire city of Aarhus. That's how successful Aarhus is in its model. And they came to us and this guy said, I want to make something called the Mental Fitness Center. This is him. He looks a little bit like a, like a roadie for a heavy metal band. But he's a super genius, this guy Erland Heustend. And he said, and I'll give you a couple of direct quotes. He said, I want to make a perfect museum. It's the friend that you want to spend time with. It's something that sometimes talks and sometimes listens. It's sometimes funny, and it makes you better. He said, we talk about Aros as a mental fitness center. At first, you start with lightweights, and then you get heavier experiences, and so on, and so on. And then he said it should have a social effect. You know, you can take a stand as a museum. You can talk to the broader public. And then lastly, and this has been brought up today, he said, we want to understand what's unique about digital, what's unique about the tool. If you have a Monet painting, you have to go there to see that unique painting. He said, don't do what a book can do. We already have books. Okay, look at your digital tools and figure out something that's unique that you have to come to the museum to experience. And then I asked him after all of this, I said, well, how do you think we should do that? And he said, oh, I have no idea. That's your job. I was like, okay, that's great. So we spent a lot of time doing strategy, and you can see the positioning on our projects is very, very extensive. We spent a lot of time talking with clients. What are we trying to achieve? Who's the audience? What's the transformation? What's the mission? How does this tie back to the foundational elements of who your museum is and what you're trying to achieve? And so here you can see this is the stuff we decided we definitely didn't want to do, right? You talked about a lot of this today, digitization of the collection, you know, saving or favoring. That's, that's fine. Erlen was like, yeah, yeah. All of that stuff exists on your phone. I don't want people looking at their phones. People look at their phones too much. So we started prototyping around a range of different ideas, both looking at new technologies and new types of interactions. And prototyping, as I said at the beginning, is the key to us to creating experiences. 
Right? If you're designing something that happens between you and a work of art, or between you and another person, between you and an archaeological ruin or a piece of history, you need to understand what that experience is actually like. So the first thing you need to do is have an idea, and then quickly you need to prototype it to see how people will be interacting with the idea itself. So you can see this is one of the first generation of clear LCD screens. This is in our studio in New York City. We had the whole curatorial team in New York for a number of days. And we're looking at the ways in which people are actually inside and between themselves and interface using the artworks to create portraits of each other. This is a separate installation that uses eye tracking, which I'll show you. Uh, and then this is an installation where you're looking at an artwork, again, through a clear LCD screen, and you're interviewing each other about your thoughts on the artwork. So the first work, which is this, which we call the art of looking, the idea was that these interfaces were artworks unto themselves. And the idea here was to use actually military grade eye tracking software that allows people to understand how they look at artworks. Right? Putting a little bit of critical analysis on their own gaze and a way in which they could understand what it is that they're doing when they're doing something and looking at the artwork. Because that is arguably where the artwork happens, in the creation of looking unto itself. So this being a contemporary art museum, we had a lot of their favorite works, which we put in here. And again, instead of the average time that people look at artworks, which in Aros, they've clocked at about one second, people spend about seven minutes looking at artworks and engaging with them here. Right, so you look and it actually shows you back how you looked at that artwork. From here, to there, to back, to there. <laughs> and it shows you a story of your own looking. This is the story you tell yourself when you look at an artwork. This is how you look at artworks that's unique to other people. And that analysis suddenly makes you aware of all the ways in which you have this dialogue, this relationship with all of these artworks, and then shares it publicly and shares different insights. And suddenly, again, this becoming a public space where you're looking and you're having an intimate experience with an artwork, but that's shared with everybody, really dramatically changes the work and, made, and creates a different type of museum. Separately from that, we have this portrait machine, so the art of creating. The first thing that's amazing about this is the ways in which you talk about an inclusive museum. Part of being inclusive is inviting people in. And one way to invite people in is to make an interface where you can do lots of interesting creative things that are fun, that are playful, that our expectations are towards a level of play and generation. So this creative act that's necessarily democratic, that's necessarily open to all different types of people, creates a level of joy and excitement so this we just shot on our little iPhone during the opening, but you see the ways in which people discover themselves and are just delighted to understand their playful interplay with the artworks themselves. And I'll share, but people are basically making their own portraits that they're then able to share with other people, again, promoting the museum. And then the last piece, which we call the art of conversing. And we love this because it invites people to have a dialogue around an artwork. It poses an unusual question around them. So you go into this booth, and through, a, again, a one-way screen, you're able to see an artwork, and it asks you this question. If you were flying this, where would you go? Right? And this is actually the <coughs> But what I'm wondering is what, what, kind of, what kind of sound will this uh, chopper make? Mm. Can, you, can you try to make that sound? A sound? Wait, I think I know. La 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 she said, I have to tell you something, you know, I mean, like anyone, all of us, she's like, you know, on bad days, I literally, I just go in and I click on the file folders to listen to people's conversation. It makes me so much happier about my job. It makes me think that I'm actually doing something of value because of these experiences that are made. And again, it's just an open invitation to people. This actually outputs this as an animated GIF. So it uses voice recognition and just makes a little bit of a, a digital piece that you can share on Instagram. It's a little souvenir. It's just fun. But it's a way, again, to make a memory and to step people into making a memory that's surrounded by the artworks themselves. 
And the ways in which you find people seeing themselves having these qualitative experiences is so moving to all of us because we love the artworks and we love to hear people actually thinking and meditating on the artworks as well. And so when you put all of this together, it does really change what the museum itself is. So it sits in tandem with these very interesting uh, art installations, and it invites people on all these different levels to have conversations and dialogue around it. So Aro's public sits in this much larger nexus of all these public programs that they create. It invites almost like a specialty membership lounge for people who are part of Aro's. And it elevates it in all of these new ways where people can play, they can present, they can have different kinds of conversations that they're invited inside of. They can actually spend all of this time together. And since they opened this, their membership has gone even higher because it's this incredible sort of art lounge where people just want to hang out and have fun. They meet people there. Uh, and they're constantly getting members who are coming by just to see what's going on. And part of it is the ways in which all of these different recordings that they make or the portraits that they fabricate are then shared through social media. And it tells a much bigger story than just a good sort of film or a content piece. It takes these works of art and it reveals them back to visitors in ways that are unique and really about them and their relationship to the artworks. And in that way, I think it lives up to what Erlen was looking for, right? It's a museum that listens as much as it speaks. It's a museum that challenges you, but that also invites you to challenge yourself it's a museum that shares insights about you and makes you really a, a, almost a better person, a better art lover, because you suddenly know a little bit more and are invited. And most of all, it's a social space. And that's a thing that museums, particularly with technology, abandon. They forget that you go to a museum to be with your grandson, to go on a date, to learn something as much about the other person and ask them what they think about this artwork or what they know about this piece of history or what they understand about this part of science. And this is a space that actively engages people to understand each other through the art museum itself and that isn't afraid to say, these artworks have a job to do, not just for you to pay attention to them, but for them to facilitate ways that you can discover things about yourself. And so when you look at the museum, you see ways in which suddenly the artworks mean all sorts of new things to every single visitor who comes in and is able to transform those artworks, to have a personal relationship with those artworks, and to share them with everyone. And with that, I'll say thank you so much.